Thank you, Ted, for the introduction. Again, the local community garden and the church building for hosting this event. It's easy from the afternoon to roll into the second floor. And uh, I thank you for being here and want to know more about, from my perspective, about the GM science. And like I have been on this topic for since 1988. And I'll talk about, like, you have had speakers about GM science a lot. And like, Don Huber was in uh, Perth and talked about GM one and a half years ago. Huber. Two. Huber. Huber. Uh, Huber. Judy Carmen. Yeah, Judy and Judy Carmen, yeah. So you've had uh, up to date science from, from them. So I'll mix it with some personal experiences, some stories about that, what I, why I'm so strong against GM science and what the holes are in the GM science, the unproven parts. And of course, uh, yeah, I'm then, like, I've got a PhD and I work for CSRO and, and I always work with pharma groups, because I always try to work with pharma groups to get to the paddock and get the paddock field explained. Uh, and then, I was then mixing my theoretical knowledge with the local practical knowledge to improve the system. And you can't do that alone as a theoretical knowledge base. You need the practical local experience, the ecosystem, local ecosystem explained to make improvements. And like in the early 80s, when I started working in southern and southern irrigation areas, I was like the first scientist that went to farms to do research. And everywhere was amazed. And I had so many friends on the farms because I was listening to them and I was obtaining their knowledge. Uh, and that has always been my perspective, but then my, my colleagues started to question me because I didn't do enough on research stations and I didn't write enough scientific papers. And I said, well, I don't write scientific papers, I have half-truths. And like in my whole upbringing, and, and then the university in the Netherlands where I went, like my professors that were my role models, they had been boys on a farm, and then after the Second World War, they went to university to study science, but that was still a broad science after the Second World War. And then they started working in a job, and then they became a professor because they were specialized in one field. So they had this holistic picture of the whole farm because they grew up on the farm. They knew everything. And when I asked those professors questions, because I was always asked questions, right from primary school as well. <laughs> and I had three teachers that were fairly good for me. And they were encouraging me and supporting me. But uh, of course the principal, he pushed me down because I knew too much. And I questioned him. And he couldn't stand it. So, so, that, 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 so I was a boy like that when I was 12. So then at the university, I had these professors and I asked questions. Because like you learn the soil science, you learn plant science, you learn about insect diseases, uh, economics, chemistry, all these separate streams of knowledge, nothing connects them. So I always had questions, what about this, what about that? And two professors in the room, my home robots, my heroes, I asked them questions and then they said what they knew, but then they said, oh, I don't know how it works. They said, the professor said, I don't know. These days, not many professors say, I don't know. There's always no. something, that they're just talking in the wrong direction. And then, but they said, I don't know, keep asking. That's how I went to life, keep asking. And science is, you ask a question, and then you design an experiment to get the answers. And if you don't get money, you, you, don't get, you, you can't get the answers. So then you keep asking. And that's what I did with GM. And then I was just a bloody dustman to the cross. <laughs> because I kept asking questions like DNA. And DNA is the language of life. So we go from the plant with cells. And then in the cells, the chromosome, the nucleus, and then the, the gene, DNA. With all those characteristics of what the gene looks like, what it does. And that's how genetic engineering started to have to want this one gene into a new plant and then express itself and get beautiful uh, results. We can change life with GM. And that was like in 1988 when CSRO had this forum, CSRO 2000. And now I look back, gee, only 12 years before 2000 they had this big forum, 2000 with the science required for 2000, or beyond 2000. And they asked me to talk about the farming system, 
So I gave a talk about the farming system, how everything is connected and what the issues were for the long term sustainability of farming. And every talk by scientists in the day, it was all, oh, oh we can fix that with GM. Oh, we can fix like salinity. We can, we can fix that. A salinity. Oh, we can fix that. Nitrogen use. Oh, we can fix that. We can make plants with less light. Oh, we can fix that. We can make high quality. Each time, and there were the same three or four of those high uh, gene scientists standing up all the time. We can do this. We can do that with GM. And then, in the aftermath of that uh, occasion, I was completely dismissed that oh, you didn't see anything wrong, anything new, it was, uh, there was no science in there, it's not. Completely, and uh, there were like people that knew, knew farms, and I, thought, I gave the same talk to the farming community, and they saw the picture because they know the farming system, they know how everything connects, and how difficult it is to make the connections. So that's the world I was in with CSRO. And, and in the mid 90s, I was made a fellow of the Australian Institute of Agriculture, like the F. A I A. So my peers in the mid-90s made me a fellow. So the peers said, stop it, that's a good job, he's a good scientist. Because there was all the connection to the farming community, all the things I was doing in raising making new systems like crop monitoring. I was the first to make crop monitoring systems, to get plant parameters measured, observed. And if, if that plant parameter is not there, if you don't have that tiller there, then you have nitrogen efficiency. And if you have that stimulant gauge starting, then the plant stops. All these things as, as monitoring measures. So I was rated by my peers as that's good. And like now in New South Wales, the, the, the director of agriculture of New South Wales department at that time, every time I see him now, it's always, oh, you were the one that improved the most in irrigated farming in that, in that time. So, then I kept asking questions about GM and I went the way of good farming to reduce fertilizer use and chemical use to stimulate the soil biology that, you, that, we have, that we can use less fertilizer and chemicals, that the whole system takes over, the, the ecosystem. And then I was stopped in my tracks. I was not allowed to continue. And in the end I was kicked out eight years ago. And some of those points will come, in, come back in, in the <coughs> talk. So it's, it's funny to see that like I was kicked out ten years after they made me a fellow uh, by the same peers. They couldn't connect with my world of thinking about biological science and my questions that I asked about the gym. So this will, will, after this introduction, this is what I will talk about. Like the impacts of genetically modified. What do genes tell us? The problems in agriculture. Do we need GM? Why is supported to improve food production? Why is GM supported to improve food production? Impacts on health of animals and humans. Science. What knowledge? Who's truth? So what do genes tell us? Well, the DNA doesn't tell us how it works. Genes are switching on and off to adapt. Epigenetics. Like whenever something happens, genes switch on and off to adjust to the local condition. Just to, to adjust to the local ecosystem. And of course, there's crosstalk between genes and the environment. Like all the agronomists always talk about, ah, oh, GYE is important, this variety is good, GYE, or this animal is good here, like the brown ones up north and the, in the south, the GYE is not good. But in my time, in my world of going to the farms and looking at the same varieties and the expression of, of the same variety, I came to the point of management and the management. The management is the most critical part, because management changes the whole environment that the gene expresses itself in. And some genes are switched off, some genes are switched on, and you get a completely different picture. So if that management is with lots of fertilizers and chemicals, you get a different plant than when you grow that plant in a healthy soil with uh, good carbon, good local soil fertility, and bugs in the soil that make the plant resistant to insects and diseases. So conditions determine the gene expression. That's very important. And for us humans, it's exactly the same. And like now with the fast food system, uh, the last uh, two, three decades, well, um, the last two generations accumulating, 
then we get more and more problems because the genes start to adapt themselves and the variability of the microbiome in the body, the bugs in our intestinal system, start to separate. Now, the DNA. So what's important with the DNA? Like here we have the bees, and the queen bee is here in the middle. Like the queen bee is 50% bigger than the workers, has a different color and a different attitude. The DNA of the bees and the work of the, the queen bee and the workers is exactly the same. The DNA of the queen bee is exactly the same as the workers. But the larvae started to feed one bee with special food. And that larvae became the queen. So giving special food to the same larvae as the worker larvae created the queen bee. So the genes switching one off to create the, the bigger body size, the different color, and the different mental attitude. So that's how food can change our genes. So that's why it's important to step back from all our chemicals that surround us, all those chemicals surrounding us forces genes to switch on and off. And as we go back to less chemicals, less chemicals in our world and don't use fertilizers for our food and we get more minerals in the food, then we become strong and healthy and happy. So this is the example of the poor nutrition and synthetics in food. Like this is the mineral status of a healthy body. And as that body can't maintain that healthy mineral status, we start to slide down. We get immunity problems, growth of fertility problems, and in the clinical science, cancer, and all the chronic diseases, etc. And then, of course, this doesn't have to be in a lifetime, because it can happen, like in epigenetics, it can happen over generations, the epigenetic impacts. Like epigenetics is the whole uh, science of what genes are switching on and off, and how genes are switching on and off. And the generational effect. effect. So, if after the first, like, my parents, or they never ate fasting, uh, in, in my parents' generation, like, they could come to here, and then those parents will see the child, and that child starts at the level, and then that child starts eating fast food and animals, etc., and it could see the child here, and then the third generation is in this world, with all the problems right from childhood. So that one, and 20 years ago, people said, ah, oh, like, ovarian cancer is only for women above 40 or whatever. But then, like, that is ovarian cancer now of girls of 20. Why? It's all this sliding down the system. So we have to be careful with our genes and we have to make our genes strong again. Because each, each generation influences the next. And that's what my daughter does with the, as a nutrition dietitian in the right ballpark of good health that she uses like the recommendation of uh, preconception cleansing to clean the house of all the cameras, all the spray cans, etc. and start eating the good food, the wholesome food and several foods, don't touch them and then she has uh, couples that were on IVF, the wife is on IVF that they conceive the child because with that good food and getting the whole cameras in the house the whole hormonal balance starts to work again and it's happening so that's the, what we can do with our genes that switch on and off. Very important that we are in control of our own body. Our management of our body is critical to the gene expression. So productivity problems in agriculture, like the science solution is genetically modified. But that's a science solution from the geneticists, etc. But geneticists don't know what the farming system is. Geneticists don't know what agriculture is. And geneticists can look for a problem to use GM for. Like they designed the technique like to, to shoot some uh, new desired gene transfer into a host. They, they developed that technology and then they looked around, how can we use that technology? So they came to herbicide tolerance, to, because they said, oh, we want to use a less and benign herbicide. And like life said, Roundup is a benign herbicide compared to 2,4-D. Because 2,4-D, like Agent Orange, is bad. So if we use uh, Roundup, then we can get rid of 2,4-D. But now in that world of uh, GM use, so then they made uh, Roundup ready uh, corn, maize, cotton, canola, that you could spray the crop with Roundup that kills all the weeds 
but it let the crop grow. And now they get resistant weeds. And also in the non-GM world, they get resistant weeds. So now, the same in the economy, they start to use 2,4-D as the herbicide to kill the problems. And the industry is making a 2,4-D GM crop to spray 2,4-D on a crop without killing the crop, only killing the weeds. And that's all happening in our world. And 2,4-D is, is, is like, like it was the same company that made Agent Torres and the component of Agent Torres is 2,4-D. And then the, the geneticist said, oh, we can make insect resistance. Then we would use less pesticide. So they took the Bt bacteria and inserted that in cotton and soybean to get the resistance, insect resistance. And that's the story there. And using less pesticide. And still they use like, oh, we use 80% less pesticide than we used the non-GM. But that's the applied, the spray pesticides. They now have a pesticide on the seed, so they pickle the seed with the pesticide, with the insecticide that is then long-lasting, so you don't get pressure of insects with that pickled seed with insecticide. And in the, using less pesticide, that, that, the, that chemical is not included in the statistics because it's not applied during growth, it's not very good to see. And like this week again, talking with the farmers about biological farming, like you get to, in the discussion, and the, like, the seeds these days are like Smarties, and, 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 and M&Ms, like very big, all the coatings on the seed, and each time it's a different color, because the hot chemical is sprayed on. So that's the world we're in with our modern farming. And then, of course, like in 88, all those promises, and they are still empty promises. Oh, high yields. There's an analysis in the United States, from the statistics in the United States, the, the production statistics in the United States, and that analysis says, with, with the GM introduction, the yields now with GM are not higher than they would have been if we had continued with the non-GM trades. And like in South Africa, they were breeding drought tolerant maize. And then Bill Gates came and Bill said, oh, GM is a good solution. And, and then when Obama came in, the Americans said, oh, you need to use GM corn to feed your people. And so it was basically forced on South Africans to have GM corn. But now a scientific paper shows that, and then they said, oh, we can make a, a drought tolerant uh, GM corn. But now a scientific paper from uh, South Africa demonstrates that the current non-GM maize varieties are more drought tolerant than the GM corn. <laughs> because it's all promises, it's all empty promises. Because like the more drought with less fertilizer, drought, acidity, salinity tolerance, all those tolerances are so complex in the genes, it's not just one gene that you can shoot in. It's a complex of genes that all talk to each other and make that field neutral. And in the biology, that can be, the soil biology can do that for us. As I talked in the session this afternoon, and we walked in the garden to look at things. And I'm not sure what else follows in this talk on the soil. As Janet said, that I will talk about it. But like I can talk for three hours, but you would want to get quiet. So I'll continue talking. And if you have co are even questions about the whole soil, because we can achieve that now with our balance of farming. To stimulate the soil biology and get resistant plants, we don't need. And like in India, resistant cotton plants don't need GM cotton. They they grow the cotton in a way on a good soil, and that's why organic cotton in India is booming because the demand is there and they can do it. And then like as all these complex uh, solutions, there's no way they can, you can do that with GM. And then more nutritious food. Like you had that uh, vitamin A rice example a decade ago, and that scientist came to see his row in Canberra and gave a seminar, and I questioned him with some questions, and he became angry. He says, oh, I always sit against it. And I'm happy that somebody becomes angry, because my boss became angry against me as well. Mm -hmm. And I'm calm then, because I ask a question, can't you answer it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And then pharma crops, like medical, medicinal crops. The most stupid proposal I ever saw. 
that you can put something like in a cabinet or in a beam, some pharmaceutical that can help for a disease. <laughs> and then like you need 10 hectares to supply everything for the whole country or 100 hectares. I mean, how in the heck can you then distinguish that carrot from a normal carrot or that bean from that? It's plain stupidity. But it gives scientific papers. Those scientists that try it, they write scientific papers and they are the heroes. So oh, it's new science, new science. But where is the application? What was his idea about vitamin A rice? Yeah, oh, vitamin A rice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Vitamin A rice. And of course, if you have to get your vitamin A from rice, then you are in a bad world. You need to have like a carrot with it as vegetable oh. and some veggies, vegetables and all that stuff. Because it's just, it was all about uh, the eye, the, 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 fish, the eye quality of machine fighting made for eyes. And, okay, so that was that story. Uh, genetically modified. So what's genetic, genetic modification? Well, like genetically modification, you insert a desirable foreign gene or gene expressions, like the RNA, plus a virus, plus an antibiotic gene into a host, followed by selection and crossing. Like it's not just the foreign trade that's inserted, they also insert like a virus and an antibiotic, because without those they can't select. Like if you put a virus and antibiotic genes in there, then you can spray something over the seedlings, and those that die, you don't select because they don't have the desired gene in there. Those that survive have that desired gene, so then you, you keep them growing. So the, the virus and antibiotic genes are a tool in the selection procedure. But like a professor of virology at ANU, opposite the road of seeds row in Canberra, and whenever there was a, 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 some of outside world coming to Canberra talking about GM, uh, he, there were only five scientists then from Canberra, in the whole of Canberra, five scientists that were against GM, that came to those meetings, or that were questioning GM and came to those meetings. And one of them was that professor of virology. Because he said, with that, virology, with that virus gene in the GM expression all the time, viruses mutate all the time. Because why do we have Hong Kong flu, Mexican flu? What other names do we have? Like Spanish, all those Spanish. Spanish flu, wow. that was the big one, swine flu. Like, they, they, they mutate all the time, and then it becomes a big bug for us, and then we develop a chemical to kill them. And as soon as we, we develop chemicals to kill an organism, like all organisms on planet Earth want to live. So if we attack a flu, if we attack bacteria, then they, the survivors change their gene to survive the next onslaught. Like weeds, we select for weeds don't die then because they change their DNA in a way that they become resistant to the chemicals. And that's life on Earth. All, every organism on planet Earth wants to survive, want to live. So they change their DNA to keep living. And the forced entry makes genes unstable, with mutations likely. And that was the big point of uh, May One Ho, like the, the, the director, the, CEO, the leading scientist of the Institute of Science in Society, the ISIS in England, the International Club ISIS, that she went on that all the time. But as you shoot a foreign gene into the host, then you get the gel of the cell open to the sky and you get all the environmental impacts on that gene and you get mutations, very likely. And like of, of the million shots they make, only one could be successful. They call it engineering. It's not just every shot is right. Because in some shots, three, three genes are in that plant and they have the wrong spot, so they don't express themselves, etc. etc. So it's the engineering to produce new proteins and toxins. Potentially allergenic, less nutritious, no increase in yield, no reduced pesticide use, and disrupting ecosystems, which was published in the Antonio book of 2012, which I shall reference later. And yet, no official multi generational animal feeding study, and no monitoring of its impact. <coughs> and like that, no monitoring is the real key. Because as soon as you introduce something that could affect Populations, environment negatively. If you have a monitoring system, then you know where something is introduced and you can follow the interaction to see whether there are any negative impacts. But if you don't have a scientific monitoring, then it's just 
everywhere that GM is applied, you cannot see if something negative happens, whether it comes through the GM or another factor. So if, if, we had had, if we had had monitoring from the start, we would not be in the problems that we are now. And no official multi-generation feed studies. Well, that's a story that I can tell now. Like the first time in 2003, when the GM moratorium was running out in Victoria, New South Wales and South Australia, there was to be a panel, there was a panel operating to assess the extension of the moratorium or to stop the moratorium. So I wrote letters to those panels, etc. And I asked my boss questions about the GM and I didn't get answers. So then I told those questions to the farming community. Like I had field days and then at the field day I asked that question to the farmers. I said, you have to ask for multi-generational animal feeding studies. Because in the whole international literature there is no multi-feeding animal feeding study. Multi-generational animal feeding study. study. And I asked the boss, but I don't get answers. The next day I come back in Canberra, the boss, <laughs> bang, 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 you talk against GM, you don't know geneticist, you don't know anything about genes, when you do it again, you'll be fired. And he was angry and shouting. And I said, sir, I'm a farm assistant agronomist, and I look at the 10 year, 20 year cycle, and, I, and it's not in the international literature. So I tell the farmers to ask that to their local politician and to the scientists in the department in CSRO. No, you can't do that, you will be fired. So then I went to a lawyer and I asked, well, my science, I have questions and that's not answered by my boss. And he says, if I do it again in the public, then I'll be fired. What can I do? And he said, okay, as you are being introduced as a CSRO, I mean, invited as a CSRO scientist, then when you stand on the lectern, you can question, you can put a question mark behind you. You don't say anything else that it's bad and all that stuff. Then you sit down, and if then a GM scientist stands up and starts talking about how good GM is, as you could read in the Farm Weekly, if you read the Farm Weekly <laughs> last week and week before, all those pro, pro GM stories of a professor and a doctor from Murdoch University, all that, it's absolutely amazing. Like, oh yeah, they found, uh, G, uh, they found glyphosate in the breast milk of women. But that's not the problem. It's not that it's in there, it's the dose that's important. <laughs> like, okay, so that was uh, murder in person. I was on the story of the GM. So when a scientist then speaks about GM, then you can stand up at question time, and then you say, now I speak as a private citizen, and you can say whatever you want. The first time, a month later, with the young grain growers of southern East West Victoria. Like I, I had like the afternoon and the evening with them because I showed the whole trial set up, how you do a trial, how you do analysis of plants and soil in the laboratory, plant, go to the, to the chem lab to do analysis. So the whole process of doing science. And then we had dinner. So at the bar I was talking, one guy was asking, young, one young guy was asking about GM. And I said, well, yeah, I'm now nice to have a beer and I'm a private citizen. And I tell the story and suddenly I had this big group of young grain girls around me and they were fighting to sit at my table. And all these questions. Next day back in camera, the boss, bang, 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 <laughs> talk about Jim. And I walked out, I wasn't fired, so I knew I was right. Mm -hmm. And that happened three times, subsequent times. The complete intimidation, bullying, harassment to keep my mouth shut. And I was the only one in CSO that was speaking up. Because I was a bloody Dutchman. If I had been an Aussie, I'd laid flat 10 years ago. <laughs> sorry to say, but it's true. I was the only one, I was the only one standing up. We're right in the water. Yeah, well, of course, Steve. Yeah. Oh, it was bad. <laughs> yeah. Like, Steve didn't have a choice, but it was, it was forced on him by the canal that blew on his property. But then to stand up and yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you can have a moment of silence as well. I got a tear in my eye as well because to me, I went that road in Williams going from the Perth Airport pickup to Wagen past the farm of Janet Little as well. Yeah. And 
And like and the, the friction in the community and all the it's all farmer against farmer in that whole community. And it's the companies that, and the CSRO, that's the science that's the problem. So why they, they should have the responsibility, the government should have put the responsibility on the company right from the word go. If something negative happens, it's your fault. And the bloody CSRO scientists, funded by us taxpayers, ten million dollars a year, funded by us. Okay, so that's so you know where I'm going. The fifth time, like there was this big commercial in camera, a director of Monsanto from the United States, a lecture about the food and feed safety of GM, like in a lunch break, so everybody could come, public servants, the scientists, academics from ANU, so a full house, 250 people, and the director started to talk about how good GM is, at point one, point two, point three, point six, animal feeding. Ah, oh, the chooks, ah, oh, the eggs were so good. Oh, and, and the pig, ah, oh, the ham was top quality. And then point seven. So question time, I put my hand up. And like, you can talk about fate, like F-A-T-E. So many things have happened in my life that I didn't ask for, but it happened. And this was one of those moments. I was the first one that got the question, because the chair didn't know me. <laughs> So I said, sir, can you give me an example of a multi-generation animal feeding study? Because you have looked at small, short-term feeding or with adult animals, etc. What happens in long-term animal feeding study if you see, like, next generations, whether they're healthy, happy, and fertile? He says, oh no, we don't have to, this is a scientist speaking, we don't have to do those studies because we have used our gem for eight years in the United States and there's no problem. I said, sir, I hear many problems with animal health in those situations. How much does it cost to have an animal feeding study for like five generations, rats or mice? He says, oh, one million dollars. I said, sir, in the Canberra Times last year was this big article, if we consumers were rejecting GM food, that you would lose two billion dollars. So what's a one million dollar animal feeding study to do that? And the whole public will, will accept that as an animal feeding study that it's safe and that's good. Because that stuff is fed to us, so I'm on an animal feeding study. And then he was silent, he didn't say more. And then the next day, or the next days coming, something had changed in my environment. Like the boss in between, and the boy, they started to speak different. And, and then I figured out there was this pact to not challenge Stopper, because if you challenge him, he stands up and speaks. So keep them quiet. So then I was surrounded by the sound of silence. Nobody, that, nobody wanted to talk with me. But I, had, I always had the farming community as support troops. So I, and I, as I talk now, yeah, this talk goes in different directions. But I still feel myself like going in, in, into the car to the farming community to do trial work on properties. And as soon as I closed the door of the CSO car, I felt this incredible and driving to the, in the good times. And because that whole issue is so deep in my soul and I, I, didn't, I didn't get the answer so I kept standing up because you can't lie and cheat to me. And then like in the early phase, the United Food and Drug Administration, there's, the scientists there, there's recorded evidence of the, all those experts talking about, warning about allergens, toxins, new diseases, nutritional problems. But it was all wiped out by the pro-GM lobby and like the Food and Drug Administration, they had a new director and of course they do the recruitment and they have the selection criteria and they have the interviews and surprise surprise, they appointed an ex Monsanto scientist oh, because he's, he had such good experience in Stuff. Science, knowledge and truth. What knowledge? Who's truth? Outcomes depend on business interests. Humans in a complex ecosystem. For every action on a complex, interactive, dynamic system, there are unintended and unexpected consequences. In general, the unintended consequences are recognized later than those that are intended.
When does science industry admit unintended consequences? DDT, asbestos, nicotine, metal bromide. Like each of those cases, there were scientists that were already 20 years before it was finally banned or, or put restrictions on that said this is bad, this is bad. But it kept on going. Was the pro lobby, the pro scientist lobby always said, ah, oh, this is not good, this is not bad, this is good. And I have metal bromide there because metal bromide comes from like the Netherlands, an invention, a, a discovery. Because like in the early 90s, Oh, I, I, love, I keep losing time, mid-90s. Oh, sometime in the past, they, they discovered, like in greenhouses, it's like they have 8,000 hectares in greenhouses for vegetable production. In greenhouses, they noticed that the, wa the water was leaking, and you tuck in the soil, the PVC pipe had holes. And there was metal bromide eating in the PVC, making the pipe leaking. And they used metal bromide in those greenhouses to disinfect the soil for the next crop without disease. Mm -hmm. And like strawberries, like here in strawberries, you have, if you have two strawberry crops a year, you, you apply metal bromide two times a year. Every time before you plant a strawberry, the metal bromide disinfects the soil, because otherwise you have disease and you have low yield. So in the Netherlands, the government made immediately the decision, in two years' time, metal bromide is off the market. You're not allowed to use it. And everybody working on alternatives, working on systems, and they came up with a natural toxin, that natural occurring toxin that they could use to do, do the cleaning of the, to have it in the soil to stop the disease, etc. And I put the metal bromide in because last month I read the story here with us in Australia. The, the Australian strawberry growers still use metal bromide. Oh. Because it's so difficult to find an alternative. Oh no, we can't, we can't find an alternative. And <clears throat> so the fresh food people, strawberries, those nice big red, are they called? Are they, they are called strawberries, but uh, all those red balls? Mm. Yeah. There's no taste in it, it's, not, it's just no, big. And it's nice. So, metal bromide. And that's like the power of good R&D, and R&D, like in the Netherlands, with more R&D in the private world than the government, that you can make it a rule as a government, and then the whole world took on that metal bromide. They all signed to, that, to take that bromide out. The same as uh, Peter in the audience with the uh, refrigeration. Peter still there? Yeah, Peter. With the refrigeration uh, chemicals, that the refrigeration chemicals have to be taken out because of the carbonic station out. So then the industry has to work on what can we replace it with, etc. And as soon as we, and we humans are so smart, as soon as we get rules that in five years' time this and this you can't, then our inventiveness starts to work. How can we do this? How can we do that? But if we say, oh, we first have to find something, and then we, then we never find it because there's no pressure to do it. <laughs> so that's the metal bromide story. And then it's really modified. Question mark, question mark, question mark. GM proponents say, don't you worry about it. <laughs> better returns for the farmer, better for the environment and human health. Feed the world. Billions of meals have been consumed. No ill health. Again, no monitoring system. So all the ill health can't be linked to the GM because there's no monitoring. Negative, negatives against GM based on pseudoscience, postmodernism, by the scaremongering enemies of biotechnology. And like the GIDC is the Grains Research and Development Corporation. All the grain growers in Australia pay a levy to the grain research for every ton produced. And then the federal government matches that dollar and then they do like 50 million dollars a year research. Last year in the southern region, they have like a February they have updates that they have a tour around the country that they give the latest research to the farmers and the farmers can come to the meetings and the agronomists to hear the latest. So last year, they had a scientist in that circuit that was talking about this. Negatives, pseudoscience, postmodernism, and then he said, for example, postmodernism, pseudoscience, like astrology, <laughs> biodynamics, organics, biological farming. Like that guy puts biological farming organics in the pseudoscience because he defined, he defined pseudoscience, no scientific evidence that it works. <laughs> and I was in that Golden Seas Road to find that, 
Because like for the balance of farming, for the organic farming, for our complex ecosystems, we can't quantify that with our current methodologies. Because all our methodologies are linear lines, straight lines or curves. Or, but to go around in a circle and calculate that circle going around the cycling, and another cycle is stimulated by that cycle, and it's impossible. So that's then called, if you do the organic farming, biodynamics, biological farming, it's pseudoscience, it's postmodernism. <laughs> so the push for genetic engineering and GM, repeated words, as in commercials. Oh, it's sound science, it's peer reviewed, <coughs> rigorous testing, more scientific scrutiny than conventional. But then, more scientific scrutiny than conventional, all that science is all only on making the stuff, not testing how it works. And the testing how it works, like with, with uh, BT, they don't use the BT GM crop in that analysis. They go back to the pure BT to see that the pure BT is good. So not in the context of the, of the variety and growing that variety in the real soil. So then, did I show the ecosystem picture before the Cox? No, it was the previous. If I had shown, if I had started with like the, I have a beautiful picture like with Cox wheels in a circle, like 20 wheels, and if one turns, all the wheel turns. And like that's an ecosystem. Everything is connected with everything else. And like in the GM analysis, you have to grow the GM crop in the real world and measure everything in that real world. In the soil biology, that it doesn't kill any organisms in the soil. And in insects, beneficial insects are with the BT available every day of the year after sowing till harvest because it's in the green leaves. And then like in the food, the health of the food, etc. Yeah. So it's all laboratory work, taking only the thing in isolation to measure and it's safe, it's safe. Stringent gene regulator, technology regulator. Stringent gene technology regulator. What's that? Like our regulator is in bed with the industry, and like that's that's my first contact with Judy Carmen, because Judy made a statement. She was in camera, she made a statement, and it was in the Camera Times. So I read in the Camera Times her story. So I said I was at work, and it's work related because she talks about gen crops. So I sent an email, a CSO email, to Facets and, and and to the GMO. That, and to the GMO regulator about that the testing is not good and we have to look at this, we have to test in the real world, etc. Then, two, two days later, I get a request from the secretary of my boss to please come to his office at 4 o'clock. <laughs> so I went to the office and I was floored because he said, you communicated with the outside world about Jen. I told you that you're not allowed to do that. I said, sir, it was just an email to the regulator to ask for more testing. You're not allowed to do that. And this was CSO time, and you're not allowed. And then I saw the email. Like, my email was sent back to my boss. My email to the regulator was sent back to my boss. That's the rule. But because I was a blind Dutchman, I kept persisting. Because <laughs> for, me, for me, it became a challenge. Because how in the heck can I do that? So that, that was the, the stringent gene technology regulator. Any question that you ask, in front of a board, then you, you just have to clap down. And like the at least 30 days feeding study is the other gimmick. Like at least 30 days feeding study for GM proof that it's safe for animals. And, like, they use that adult rats to feed for 30 days. And, like, you can feed me for 30 days with some crap and I survive. <laughs> and then, like, in Germany, there was a GM corn was, was approved. But there was an uproar in the community. So then the government appointed an independent uh, assessor to go through the 1060 pages of the Monsanto report on that. GM coin to go through all the analysis. And that was Dr. Albert Pushtai. And Dr. Albert Pushtai was the first one, first scientist in the world 
who talked against GM, or who said something against GM, who said something against, he who said something in public about his study, because he was working on GM potato, and he was doing animal feeding study of potato. And he had a BBC interview, and he said, oh, the rats, the rats that were eating the, the BT potato are starting to wander around the cage, they're running and they are getting upset. And it was 45 minutes, 45 seconds interview with BBC. According to the story that Arpad, he said, oh, he came home and his boss said, oh, it was a nice interview. And the next day he was sacked. Mm -hmm. And I was in contact with Arpad because I, I asked my questions to him about, <coughs> so I felt more secure with, with his backing, etc to keep going, because he was a renowned animal feeding study, nutritional animal nutrition feeding study, to design studies with animals to check whether something is toxic or not. So then, in, in one of those, bang, 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 you're a bad scientist, you're not allowed to talk about GM, I then said, well, Dr. Alan Kustai, he says that this is uh, good and this is, and those studies are not good. And he said, ah, but is a bad scientist, he doesn't know anything about anything. So, I sent an email to Arpad. I said, my boss is angry about this and that that you do. And he said, Martin, seven years ago, your boss had a, was a co-author in a paper for me because he came to me for an animal feeding study and I was the expert in the world and he, he did the study with me. <laughs> and of course, it's a key issue. The key issue is choice for the farmer. Well, ask Steve about <laughs> what choice that is. And like, it's a choice for the farmer, but who's responsible? Well, the, the responsibility goes back to the farmer rather than the company. And the marketplace will decide. Well, yeah, the marketplace has decided. GM canola now, here the GM canola is $50 per ton less on the world marketplace than the non-GM canola. So the price is now 50% lower, $50 per, per ton lower, and that's the market price, the marketplace. And we need GM to feed the world. Well, there's a study by United, United Nations agencies, 400 scientists around the world that were in that study to feed the world. And they were all independent scientists. So they were retired professors, retired company <coughs> directors. But as soon as you work with prof the active professors and active directors, they all go to their own bed, how they can get to their own bed, or how they can stop the negatives, etc. <coughs> so that report came out in April 2008. And it showed, it gave us uh, implication, we can feed the world with agroecological farming. That's farming with lower inputs and stimulating the soil biology. And then we don't need GM and we can feed 9 billion people. Like all countries in the world signed on to that United Nations Declaration, except the United States, Canada and Australia. The three Western nation gene jockeys. So, in that whole story, I always tell people, well, just ask for quantified information. We need quantified information to keep saying no. And the quantified information about multi-generational feeding studies. So, I go back to Arpa Pustai. So, Arpa went to that. And that's another thing, like, the same with chemical releases. Chemical releases, GM releases. The companies fill in a list of questions that the regulator has. And then the regulator has to go over all those answers, whether they accept it. So, the regulator asks for an animal feeding study to show that it's safe. So then you get an animal feeding study in the report. But then, I always ask, is it the only study? Is it one in ten, one in hundred, one in thousand, one in a million? How many studies have to be to, to, to find this one? And then Arpad came to that animal feeding study and he found the, the reason why that was completely wrong. <coughs> First of all, the, the number of rats was very small. And then the starting weight of the rats was variable. Now those of you that know statistics, like if you have a low number and a variable number to start with, and then you do like a, a feeding study of 30 days, then each animal will change in weight, but because the starting weight was so different, and like that you can't find a significant difference. So that's why there was no significant difference of the feeding study for GM corn in that study. So Arpa gave that message to the German government, and the German government said, no, this one is not allowed in our country. Hmm. Was, that, was that after the, when he was 
put down. That was after that. was after that. He was an independent scientist. Then. Yeah, so this is the book of uh, Michael Antonio. Like the GM Mits and Truths, an evidence-based examination of the claims made for the safety and efficacy of genetically modified crops. And like June 2012 was the first edition. Now this, the second edition is on the internet as a PDF. Like 123 pages, 105 references, all by independent scientists doing their thing to quantify the negatives of GM. And like, of course, the GM be modified, like Jeffrey Smith wrote two books, Seeds of Deception and Genetic Roulette, in 2003 and 2005. But the whole science world always dismisses Jeffrey, because he's not a scientist, he's clear. And I said, well, there are journalists in this world that have the ability to read lots of things and make accurate assessments and write good, detailed stories about that. You don't have to be a scientist to read and critical and put things together. <laughs> and it's the same with uh, Philip Day. Some of you may know yeah. from feeding. Yeah. Philip, like he was just a dairy farmer's son. He became 120 kilos. And then his, his grandmother started to help him to get back to normal weight. And he discovered what to eat and what to do it and all that stuff. He started to read books, analyze books, analyze studies. And now he has a company that writes all these marvelous books about how to stay healthy and what to do for different diseases, etc. And he was just a dairy farmer's son, no scientist. We have very good people in our society that we should not demand like to be a PhD to open their mouth. And I don't want to be named like Dr. Martin all the time, because I'm Martin, I'm one of you. So, and, and then of course, anecdotal evidence. Like everything that farmers say is anecdotal, it's not based on science. So I tell my boss, well, make, we can make that anecdotal evidence evidence if we do a scientific study to do what the farmer says is happening. <laughs> scientific papers about negative impacts of on animals, people, and environment in that whole reference in the book myths. And the American Academ Academy, Academy of Environment Medicine. Like in that group are many medical people, and of course they're always the called the uh, alternative medicine, etc. Mm -hmm. But in that group, there are many scientists there that quantify all the negatives. And then the International Assessment of the United Nations Agencies, well, the one I quoted before, 2008, we don't need GM to feed the world. Because also like with Jeff Gates, GM for Africa. Like, if you look at the infrastructure required to grow GM crops, how in the heck the infrastructure is not there, then you have to get, every year you get a new seed to all those places, a lacking or a surf, surf, and like in the Middle Ages, surf to do the stuff that the rich people want. <coughs> and then it's farmer against farmer, and companies and science are not responsible. Well, it should be the other way around, because they bring the stuff to the farm. So, life is toxic. Well, here are three scientific papers from the alternative science that show glyphosate suppression of enzymes and amino acid biosynthesis by gut microbiome, pathways to modern diseases. But to go back to the gut and what minerals in the gut don't become available for important pathways for the, the uh, uh, en en enzyme and uh, amino acid biosynthesis in the body. And another paper, like a scientific paper, long-term toxicity of Roundup herbicide and a Roundup tolerant genetically modified maize by uh, Eric Serenini, Professor Eric Serenini. And like, he came around to Australia two years ago to talk about his publication that was then coming the next month. So he toured Australia in September or whatever, the paper was released in October. And I went to that, paper, that uh, meeting in Canberra about this controversial report that uh, Roundup ready crops were bad, the GM uh, maize was bad, and there were 25 people in the room. In the whole of Canberra, with all the academics from CSRO and AMU and public servants, 25 people. And a professor, an 80 year old emeritus professor, opened the talk. And all in that line of, in the same line of thought as uh, Professor Saravini, completely supporting all that, all, because he says, this is. Research that has to be done by our own science. If they don't do it, 
and we have to get you from France to talk about it, open, tell you, tell the story now. And then Eric went to the lectern, and then he, he looked around and said, oh, you at the back, you can sit here, there are empty seats here. And I looked around, there are three bloody scientists from CSO standing there. <coughs> and nobody, nobody else was there sitting already, so they came there too, and they, they declined to sit down, so they were standing there the whole time. And at question time, they asked the question, they said, oh, this is, fun. this is wrong, you can't do this, you can't do that. And then Eric very calmly said, okay, now we go back to the, the aim of the, the study. It was like to look at the toxicity, and what you talk about is a completely different pathway, that's normal food. We look at the toxicity levels. And if we do this, then it all is like this, and this, and this, and this, that's, that's um, and then they couldn't say anything more because that was the, the real part of the methodology. So that was another good experience to see that happening. And then Eric's paper was published and there was such an uproar in the whole scientific community, the GM community, and like on the internet, so many negatives against the art oh, of the rock it's bad, it's this, it's that, that the, the journal retracted that paper from publication. That never ever happens. But this way, the journal retracted the paper and said you, the, to, the, to the science world, you can't quote this paper anymore because it has been retracted, it's not true, it was wrongly written. written and... Yeah, it's, uh, it's a tough world. So then the long-term toxicology study by on pigs fed uh, on a combined diet of GM soy and GM maize diet from Julie Kahneman. And, uh, at the Vlieger. And again, that study was completely pushed down as this is bad stuff, this is bad science, because the outcomes were not wanted. And I, I say always to the pro GM scientists, well, do the studies yourself, show me. So, can GM affect human health? And of course, the, the toxins, like that the FDA scientists in the 80s were talking about the warnings about the impacts of the toxins, life APT, new proteins that enter into the new plant. And like the WHO, the World Health Organization, this year, they have now declared Roundup, like as the active ingredient, active uh, Roundup ready crops, that you can spray a crop with the Roundup herbicide without killing the crop, but you only kill the weeds. That substance is now called a probable carcinogen. And it's one step away from it is a carcinogen. And again, like on the internet, in the world, all these, and in the newspapers, all these stories, oh, that's bad, it's all emotional driven, it's not true. And, well, the health organization don't easily make decisions, and this one is right up. And like in the Netherlands and in Germany, you can't buy glyphosate anymore in the garden stores to spray your lawn to kill and spray around your house to kill weeds. So the zero wheat and the weed killer that we have in our garden stores are banned for sale in the Netherlands and Germany. Only professional uh, companies, uh, only professional users can still use Roundup. But it's one step away, and like in Denmark, that they are flagging for Europe to take the Roundup off the market in three, four, five years time, whatever, before it's too late. Because gene, gene transfer to gut bacteria, that's the issue. And like the viral gene, antibiotic gene, and the bacteria in the gut, that can take up, be affected by the GM substances. So problems with glyphosate in GM crops. Independent studies have shown abortions and birth defects in rats and rabbits. Clinical data in areas growing GM soil show increased birth defects in cancers, DNA damage. Exposure resulted in endocrine disruption, like the whole hormone processes go bang, go back past, reproductive problems, immune system responses. In FIFO long-term red study with GM corn, two to three times more to die, and four tumors up to 600 days earlier. There's all these negatives, so that's from Eric Serenin's study. New plant diseases and immobilization of minerals. And 85 to 99% reduction in mineral content of GM corn compared to the adjacent paddock in the Midwest with normal corn. And that was a school project of a student with a retired scientist. And they found these big problems. And they also found, like in the GM corn, 
Formeldehyde. Was formeldehyde in the GM coin. And then the whole world, the whole science world came again on top of them. Ah, oh, this you can't do that can you, because this is a good, not a good study because you compare a GM corn in one paddock with a non-GM corn in the other paddock, but that corn fried can be completely different and it can already have a higher content of all those stuff and blah 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 blah. So that's always the issue of whenever there is something different that they have this army of talks of science saying it's bad. And that's another nice story like of the round the table coffee table talk in CSRO and at the GRBC updates sitting in the bar talking with some scientists. Like in the 90s and on, in the knots, in, yeah, whenever there was a negative story about GM, you had like this avalanche of positive stories. Like 10 stories, oh it's good, it's good. And one of those guys that wrote positive stories, like I knew him from like the science world with the, the grain research and development corporation. He was working with weeds. I was working with wheat. And he was a pro GM scientist. And he wrote stories defending GM outside his own territory. And then the story also went, like whenever you write these pro GM stories, you get 5,000 bucks. That was the marketplace. That's why they got this avalanche of positive stories all the time. And this is then the picture of like an association, like the, the chemical load from all our chemicals in our world now on small kids. And with the epigenetics, that small kids that are born now are more susceptible to all the negatives because their immune system is so low. But the whole chemical load, all the chemicals in our surrounding, and with including the glyphosate, like the glyphosate on the grain that's desiccated before it's harvested. And then the glyphosate will be in the flower, and then the glyphosate is in the breast milk of the mother. And the, the association with autism. Like this increase of glyphosate in the United States, in line, and the bars are the increase in autism. And of course, people say, ah, oh, you can't. As you can't associate that because it's not the life cycle does well. well, I say, if we make a curve of all the chemical use, it still goes up like this because the, the life cycle is dominant as well. So wherever it goes, it's the increased ke chemical use and how we use that chemical that creates all the problems. And then like Stephanie Seneff, the scientist that is a food nutritionist and follows uptake of minerals and enzymatic activity in the body, she has a good scientific paper that shows that like minerals, like manganese, required for one process to make some hormone or some enzyme or whatever, uh, is blocked by the GM uh, glyphosate, the, the Roundup Ready glyphosate in the stomach. Because like, well, like the glyphosate has, the glyphosate is a chelator. Did I say that at the start of this talk or was that previous talk? No, he didn't Yeah, yeah, okay. So with that glyphosate in the stomach, like it attracts all the minerals, so those minerals can be used to activate like processes in our body, and the enzyme, enzymatic and all the biosynthesis, etc. And then you get the chronic diseases because those blocks are important to kickstart some processes in the body, and if they don't happen, then you, you get a disease. So, the scientists extrapolated this line of increase of, of uh, autism and they came to the point that in 50% of the kids in the United States will have autism in 2032. That's extra extrapolation of this curve. And like that's that's a frightening occurrence. And then people say, oh with, with the GM crops that's not a problem. I'm saying no, it's not just GM crops, it's the bloody Roundup ready on the, the, the Roundup on the wheat crops as well. Like if 95% of all the grain harvested has the GM, the glyphosate. Okay. And then Roundup not degrading in the field. Like when Roundup was released in 1977 or thereabouts, the studies had proven that Roundup was breaking down in 24 hours. Like in any field on planet Earth, 
Roundup was breaking down in 24 hours. They were there it was tested. Now, like this is a study in Argentina, where like you get a reduction, because you're not allowed to do these studies in the United States, a reduction in nutrient uptake following the Roundup application. So with all those Roundup ready crops, where you spray Roundup on a crop and the weeds die, the plant survives. Then in those paddocks, the Roundup is not breaking down. So the Roundup links on the soil and then it is a chelator that attracts minerals and those minerals can't be taken out. So, so the 100% the, the bark is the control, like the modern variety soybean without gem. But this one is the Roundup ready soybean. And like 80% of the minerals are reduced in uptake. And that's uh, an observation that was uh, approved, uh, affirmed by the French government. The French government four years ago sued Monsanto because on the label it says breaks down in 24 hours, but French scientists had measured Roundup in the fields that it didn't break down. And Monsanto lost that court case and they had to change the label in France. So that confirms that whole activity that in our modern world, year after year, using all those chemicals and fertilizers on farms, on paddocks, that species of bacteria start to die no longer live, become extinct, and one of them was the bacteria that breaks down the Roundup. So then Roundup is no longer broken down, and like, what they can't stop in the United States is scientists, environmental scientists, that can go around in the Midwest and take samples of waterways, and they analyze the waterways, and there's glyphosate in the water. They sample breast milk of mothers, they don't have to ask permission for Monsanto to do that. Hey, there's glyphosate in the butter milk. So all those things are, but as soon as you go to a paddock and you want to measure something in the GM crop, then you're not allowed to do that. And if you do it, then Monsanto says, well, prove to me that the field that you measured it in was a GM crop. Because then you have to come up with the, the code of the GM to prove that it was that field. Because they say if we do that, otherwise everybody can say anything about GM and it's not, we, we want to know that it's true GM paddock. Because if you ask permission, you don't get it. So, and like the girl that did a school project measuring things on a GM paddock and a non-GM paddock, she just did it. And she was not appreciated. <laughs> but I think she had a plus in the class for the yeah. words she did. So problems with BT GM crops. Like the BT toxin, so it's the insecticide toxin. Like the BT toxin from Solbacterium bacillus thuringiensis, which kills insects. Like it's an organic insecticide, and always that's always the defense of the GM science. They say, ah, oh, it was used, it is used by organic producers because it, they use it as an insecticide to kill insects. Yeah, of course they use it. But in that process, like three days later, all that BT is gone, it's all broken down and no longer active. Well, in the BT plant, the active BT is there in every cell from emergence to the, when, the, when the plant senesces, when the plant dies. So you get BT production every day. Every day present in the tissue of plants. It kills chewing pests, not sucking pests. And that's what, one thing that I said to the BT, the GM cotton, because my group, my, my CSRO part was like active working on GM cotton, they released GM cotton and say how good it was. And I said, well, it kills only the chewing pests, but not the sucking pests. So you will get a transition from chewing pests to sucking pests, because they are not killed, so they start to live. And that's what happened now, so they have to spray now more insecticide again, to kill the buggers that start to eat the cotton, because they are sucking. They are not sucking, they are just sitting on the leaf and uh, eat the plant. Uh, so, and, and those insecticides are the most expensive insecticides on the market. Hey, that's smart marketing. <laughs> and then what, what is the role of BT toxin in soil? Like what, what's exuded in the soil? How is, does, does it kill the uh, soil biology? And then the toxin in the stubble. How is it breaking down? What's happening with the toxin? In the waterways, which is now measured in the United States. And in the blood, it has been measured in, in people. So all these things are now being measured. But then like if you get that smart doctor from Murdoch University saying, can be in breast milk, but the dose is important. 
So BT corn mice feeding study, the range of immune responses, allergies, infections, etc. And this is like the GM soy rats, like from, from a young age, not, not the adult rat feeding, but young rats feeding. And these are 19 day old rats. Like this rat is fed with GM soy, this rat is with non-GM. So you can see the impact on the rats. This is with piglets, like a farmer in Denmark made this report because he, he found like he normally had always had a litter layer of 14, 15 piglets and now we got litter layers with the GM soy as the food he got litter layers of uh, 12, 11, 12, always one dead the litter, lit, litters were bigger again and we didn't have to miss all piglets everything was normal so mice fed in GM soybean like the pancreas reduced digestive enzymes and altered cell structure Liver cells damaged, higher metabolic, metabolic activity, fertility, the testicular cells changed, altered gene expression, etc. 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 GM potatoes feeding study, like rats develop precancerous cell growth in the digestive tract, smaller brains and testicles, partial degeneration of the liver, immune system change. So it's GM in complex systems. In medicine, insulin. And that's always what, what the science world was saying, the GM science. Oh, we make insulin. If we didn't make GM insulin, then so many people would die because we need GM insulin. I say, completely right. This is good. Because GM insulin is, is a controlled production system. Like GM insulin is one molecule and it's, I've seen the, the factory, a video of the factory, all these pipes and everything, everything time, temperature controlled, it has to be 18 degrees or something like that. And the whole process, temperature controlled, conditions are controlled, and the bacteria can make GM insulin, like one molecule. To me it's acceptable, because it's a whole controlled system. But as soon as you do put GM in an ecosystem, like a free world, with temperatures going up and down, and that system is so complex, that no GM solution, and then like GM crops, like it's one gene in these massive genes in a, in a plant, but in the uncontrolled conditions, all those genes change and activities change, and you can never test that that it's safe, and it's always changing. And after insulin, there are stored like one insulin, I've got the date and the time and what the company involved, but they had the problem like 150 people dying or something happened within, and then they came back to the process, and also changed the manufacturing system, and there was an error in the system and they rectified it and they what the problem was no longer happening. In agriculture, GM crops don't improve soils, because so the soils go backwards and you keep having to put more fertilizers on. Seed contamination and, and seasonal supply. Like the canola seed is so small, it can go everywhere. And then you have to kill that seed if you don't want and more seed. Long term impact, unknown, but it becomes increasingly known that it's now bad. Like, like the, the story now, the, the court case in Los Angeles against the GM world with the GM Roundup impact on the microbiome in the gut that makes minerals not available for the whole process in the enzymatic complex. And it's now a court case that's running, so we'll see what that brings. And like the last years in the United States, more and more people, consumers, become aware of the GM. So after the horse has bolted, they now <coughs> become aware, and now they have to try to, to step to turn it back. And the, in, the impact in the United States is far more visible than it is here in Australia, where we use GM crops, like promoted like a cotton and uh, canola. But uh, there's still the politicians in the regulated world, they're still in favor of more and, and like even Western Australia, the government and the opposition. It's very difficult to come up with uh, real good plans to stop the GM to get it out of our systems because there will be a long term impact no matter what. And then new diseases and other insects appear, weeds resistant to herbicide. 
in increased use of pesticides, like different pesticides to kill the bugs that are not killed by the BT, and no GM yield increase, like I said earlier on in the talk. And like this, these are pictures of like the, in, the wheat resistance, and like the guy on the right hand side, he holds a pigweed, and it's like a tree trunk. It's the, the, the cotton picker can't get past it, so now they have to have uh, fallen tree, uh, fallen tree. They have to have, have labor to get all the pigweed out of the cotton paddock before they can pick the cotton. So, obstruction to quantification. Controlled by the biotech industry. Following inappropriate methods. Design tests to get answers wanted. Ignoring data that does not fit. What is reported? The role of statistics. Calculated risks versus the precautionary principle. And that, like the precautionary principle is that you wait for a bit release before you're sure that it doesn't have a long term impact. And the whole biotech industry, science, the GM science, they all believe results doesn't paint and they don't question. You're not allowed to question. Because if you question, you can be sacked. Group thinking, peer pressure. Like group thinking. Like group thinking is very powerful. Because everybody wants to belong to a group. We all want to belong to a group. And then, if we say something different than the group, people look at you. If you keep saying that, people get upset or, and they can be pushed out of the group. And that's happening with GM. Like, our, nobody agreed with what I was saying. They couldn't put their mind on that. And they didn't want to know about it. So they pushed me out of the group. And then I was removed from the CSRO. And that they, they could continue to live happily for the next decade. Because they don't like questioning. And that's the peer pressure. And lots of those scientists have to do it because that's their only job. And if you get like a three, a three year term appointment to do something, they better write like two scientific papers a year, otherwise they don't get a job anyway. So they say yes, boss, yes, yes, yes. And they write scientific papers and they do things. And, and then the story about GMO not present in oil. Like in canola, there's no GM in canola oil. So in the press, it was 10 years ago, or before the release, before, as the moratorium was not, really, not uh, before the vote for the extension of the moratorium was made, all these stories about in the press, ah, oh, canola and cotton oil contain no protein, no gin. That was the story in the news. In the report in the Food Standards of Australia New Zealand GM canola report, on page 7 it says, not considered to contain. Yeah. On page 18 it says, all protein is virtually removed. Yeah. On page 25 it says, total protein in the field trial was 0.29 parts per million. And if we then know that so there is GM in the oil, oh, but only 0.29 parts per million. But if we then know, like with uh, peanut toxicity, even one part per billion is one part too many. And now in the science world, more and more, like in the environmental science world, me environmental medicine world, more and more, the science world comes to the, uh, the good science world, the, the questioning science world comes to the point that a small amount of chemical, a small amount of toxin, every time makes a bigger impact on health than a bigger dose. Because that small part every time, all those small little steps, and then like what I said before about epigenetics, it switches on some genes in our body and not others. We can see the child, the child again, a bit more chemical, a bit more chemical, a bit more chemical. And that's how we create autism, etc. Because it's this small amount all the time that the next generations can't cope with that small amount anymore and you get the problems. So conclusion, canola and cotton oil contain GM. GM got the solution, engineering not precise, single genes in a complex system, genes are switching one and off, at the cutting edge of knowledge, at the cutting edge of knowledge. So everything we discover in the gene technology is new. We develop new, new instruments and we can measure things. And then like suddenly, you measure things that you did like five years before, and oh wow, 
no, this is not the case, it's this. So all that new at the cutting edge of science, and at the cutting edge, at the cutting edge of science, they are leasing that stuff in crops. It's the most dangerous thing you can do, to be at the cutting edge of new knowledge and release something before you know what the implications are. So we don't want, yeah, we don't know what we don't know, and we never know what we don't know because we don't, we don't know what we don't know. <laughs> Risk can't be evaluated rationally. And the science world says everything we don't know doesn't exist. You can't say it. It's anecdotal evidence. It has to be proven by science. And it's driven by commercial gain. Who will pay the price? Well, we have one person in this room that's already paying the price. Back to agriculture. Healthy soils activate soil biology, improve soil carbon, while reducing fertilizers and minimizing chemicals. Healthy plants produce increased nutrient density, better taste, and longer shelf life. So that's again, humans a complex system. For every action on a complex interactive dynamic system, there are unintended and unexpected consequences. In general, the unintended consequences are recognized later than those that are intended. And that was Professor Duncan Brown, feed of feedback 15 years ago, a retired professor who wrote his stories up in a book, and it's the truth of life, of science life. So better health for self and earth, vote against GM, Contact your local member. Avoid overprocessed foods and drinks. Avoid synthetics, buy biological organic 